Hello my friends, hello my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, welcome to the Day In Day Out podcast. This is episode number 56, where I had the joy and the pleasure of having Maurice Nicholson on the podcast today. He is a consultant, uh, basically uh, got to the partner level, and we're basically talking about his uh, journey as a consultant, as well as other subjects as well other topics but sit back enjoy this podcast he is a very outstanding fella and yeah uh, please subscribe have a good day now peace <laughs> oh ah hello my friends hello my life warriors wherever you are in the world welcome to the day in day out podcast uh this is episode uh 56 with <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is going because uh, last night it was Liverpool winning the Premier League for the first time. I know I should not be really saying this or putting it out there, but nevertheless, good times. Ahoy. Today's guest is Maurice uh, Nicholson. He, he is a partner or former partner at uh, Kentar Consulting. Uh, thank you for coming on today, sir. How are you? Thank you for having me. Uh, great. So I'm in the midst of uh, my first cup of coffee. I, I guess you're getting ready for your first beer to celebrate. Um, but doing well. In, in the midst of the world being on fire, I, I'm doing very well. Ah, excellent. Excellent. Yes. The reason why I'm get, I got in contact with you, there was a post uh, called Black and Brilliant, which I saw, uh, which I was very privileged to be put on as an additional, same thing with yourself. And I thought, let me reach out to you because you are a person who had, like from looking at your LinkedIn profile, uh, you have come a very long way from your time at being at the Bronx uh, School of Science all the way up until becoming a consultant today. I, I was hoping you could go through some of the sort of stages of your journey. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually probably starts even before then, right? And um, uh, it probably goes back. Well, I should probably tell a little bit back about how my family got into, came into America. We're from Jamaica, both my mother and my dad um, born in Jamaica. My mother, my, my grandmother was a member of parliament in Jamaica in the 60s, right? Right after independence, but she was in the conservative party. Um, and then the political ties started to change and she started thinking about opportunities, said to her daughters to be educated in the States. With my dad, out of wedlock birth, here I come. Uh, <laughs> so I spent a lot of my early childhood um, in what you guys call council housing, right? We call right. projects, right? So, um, but it did well in school, in my academics. Um, and I was blessed blessed you know as you get to the stage you start reflecting back on all these things mm. and I was blessed I had a teacher in the sixth grade say you know what Maurice you're really really smart and she started exposing me to these different um, academic programs for talented kids and one of the things she she told me was um, and I'll never forget this God helps those who help themselves mm. can you hear me yeah, yes, yeah. I can hear and you. And so, so, yeah, you wonder where I'm going with this. So <laughs> no, no, I no. never forgot that. I never forgot that. And um, more importantly, I started taking exams into specialized high school, specialized junior high school, specialized high schools. Um, and then I ended up at Bronx High School of Science, which is probably like one of the top five high schools in America. Um, at that time, lots of Caribbean kids there mm. who were also immigrants, so a lot of kids from Asia. Um, Southeast Asia, Indian subcontinent, a lot of immigrant white kids. That's where all these smart kids who couldn't afford private school ended up going. Um, and it was there I sort of found myself in a way and got confidence. Um, and started to believe in my own uh, capabilities um, mm. and started to see a world bigger than from where I came, right? It's always, it's not enough to have the talent, but you actually have to, have to see the possibilities and understand that something can be for you. And so it's through that experience with, with my sixth grade teacher and that experience that said, hey man, there's a much bigger world out there and you have a right to claim a big piece of it mm -hmm. despite what, what some, in, some might show you and some of the media might 
portray um, I started to believe it's like that person's no better than me, that person's no better than me, that fact, right? I'm better than them, yeah. you know, intellectually, and I should, you know, have the right to go there. So um, it's with that, I figured out. So my grades, so while I tested, well, my grades are just okay. Uh, <laughs> it's like, okay, I need, I need to figure out something else to help me get into university. Quickest sport I could pick up um, is track. So, you know, run hard, turn left, run hard, turn yeah. left, right? And so I got a track scholarship, or a partial track scholarship, partial academic scholarship into Boston University, did well there, um, both athletically and more importantly, academically. Mm. Had a professor, you know, and this is a really important thing, right? You know, and a lot of things that us as black people, as people of the African the diaspora don't oftentimes have is a, an advocate, somebody who sees the potential in you. And as I talk about, you know, my career as I reflect upon it, um, there are moments where I was able to move forward, not just because I worked hard or whatever, but I also had an advocate to sort of say, you know, here's something that you could pursue. I'm going to expend my personal uh, capital, if you will, to yeah. connect you into my social circles, right? And that's one of the things that we talk about in the Black and Brilliant uh, subgroup um, is how do we get more people spending capital, their social capital, to advocate on behalf of other Black people to help mm. them move forward. So th this, is, this has been a theme, um, not as much as I would like, and we need to increase that, but in the key moments, um, I had the ability, and then somebody recognized that ability, and somebody got behind me. So that's how I got from Brock Science to Boston University. And then from Boston University, I got my first job. Um, after I, I did well in this one professor's class in operations management, he was doing some consulting on the side for a company in the Midwest of America, like your high, um, your Midlands equivalent. And um, he put in a good word for me. I got a job out there, a um, place called. Kansas, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I, I can tell you all sorts of cultural, um, <laughs> funny cultural situations, but you know, being a black man of Caribbean descent in the middle of America, you know, you sort of like, it's <laughs> just out. overwhelming. You stand out, right? And you realize like, you know, the America that you were living in on the coast is very different than America, in the mm. middle, but you know, it, it may be better. Had a great stint. It was an aircraft co company called Beach Aircraft. We're making planes. Great stint. Always knew it was going to leave. And then the same person that advocated for me and got me that job um, had done his doctorate in business at the Harvard Business School. Um, so when it came time for me to apply, I could turn back to him and he wrote me a recommendation. And, uh, and I got in. And so that's, that's my... A little bit of my academic background too. Yeah. Because, I'll pause there. Yeah, no, because this is the thing. Like I uh, going like getting into a top five school in the United States, that is like a mission on itself. And it's quite fortunate that you had someone in your corner to sort of mm -hmm. like go, do this, do that. Yeah. Um yeah. and then basically from there going to Boston University like doing track. What were you running in track, by the way? Yeah, man, I was, um, I was a 400 meter guy. I was everything from 100 to 400. Yeah. I still feel like, I still feel like I got unfinished business with the sport at this late stage of my life. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I was, I was not bad. I was not bad. I never, I never really lived up to the full potential. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was my, that was my mm. point for me to yeah, no, but like doing that to get into uni like get into university to do business administration, and then mm -hmm. finding someone who was an advocate for you uh, to help like guide you along the way. Um, like with regards to mention the black and, like black and brilliant. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, do you find the people who advocated for you were very important in putting some key foundation stones? in your sort of future career path? Uh, I, think, I think they were. They were at least found, they were really important in, in terms of sort of giving you some, some guidance, right? Now, there are things that I didn't get, right? You know, again, stepping back to who my parents were, right? Immigrants yeah. to the country, 
mom didn't, I mean, she didn't finish high school until late and then she went to college like when I was an adult, right? And, and so giving me guidance, uh, teaching me social etiquette in the business world just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Same for my dad, right? So you have to at least find ways to observe and learn. Mm -hmm. um, and get in place where you can observe and learn. If you're a quick study, you could you could you could pick it up. The sad reality is, you know, there's probably a lot of stuff I didn't learn um, because I didn't have enough of that, right? But I I got a door open and I made the best with what 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 was in front of me, um, which is great. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I would say, you know, when I look at Black folks writ large, America. South America, the, the European continent. I mean, I think that's an area where we lack. Um, you know, if I think about things that I want to do to get back, it's just sort of, you know, helping people have the ability to navigate these worlds. Mm -hmm. um, some guidance, some advice at key moments, how to navigate politics, you know, the corporate politics and all of that stuff. Mm, yeah, no, I would say when it comes to sort of corporate politics, many, like many of us, I think when you're sort of thrown in there, like young, like young eyed, bushy tailed, like, as they say, full of piss and vinegar, it's a case mm -hmm. of like, no one actually tells you what that sort of etiquette is, what the sort of ups and downs and how to not so mm -hmm. much play the game, but to basically help put you yourself in the best light. You know? Yeah, no, it's interesting, right? You know, it's one thing that you, so in all social interactions, there's tension and mm -hmm. there's aggression, right? And there's confrontation. And, but if you grow up in council housing or projects, right? Like when you get hit with that confrontation, yeah, there's an adrenaline rush that sort of releases your fight or flight mechanism. And in that mechanism, incense certain behaviors in that moment, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, look, man, somebody come for test you, you're, you immediately get up and, yeah. and you really, but in the corporate world, you have to really tamp down that and you have to be really measured on how mm -hmm. you respond and how you artfully deal with people through words, um, through diplomacy um, versus hard standing your ground, letting you know whether you're, 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 you're not going to stand for something like that. There's a way to, to navigate these things with, with delicacy and play that mm. game, build allies, um, which I learned over the years, but you know, my early days in, in corporate America, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, stories, stories, stories. My, my son will be better for it, right? He'll learn from me. Absolutely. And, you know, and others will learn from me, I hope. Yeah, no, that, like, I'm sure they will, because like, yeah, mm. I, think, I think you've got the focus and your head screwed on uh, tightly enough to uh, like, go, yeah. okay, this is where your dad did this. Don't do yeah. that. Do this yeah. instead. It will help you out in the long run. Um, yeah. yeah. But to sort of like go from the East Coast, look, I've been to America and I've been on the East Coast of the United States, first in Virginia, where I worked in a summer camp, a religious a religious mm. camp and then basically the rest of my time I was in upstate New York uh, with the Fresh Air Fund I don't know if you know those guys oh yeah yeah well aware well aware yeah yeah so like I was in uh, the, like I was in Camp Hayden Marks uh, up in Fishkill I don't know if you yep. know I know Fishkill yeah not too far from here yeah yeah so basically I like knowing how like I got sort of, uh, how can I say, I got a glimpse of how kids sort of interacted with themselves from like different parts of New York, just because they were just chucked together, welcome right. to camp and away they go. So doing that jump from the East Coast to the like Midwest, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. How, like, what was the sort of, what was the sort of things you picked up on? What were the challenges you found? Yeah. Oof. I mean, it's, you know, in this moment, I think America, the veil of America is being peeled off, peeled back, right? Mm. Um, right. So, you know, America is sort of like South Africa with a better economy and a much better marketing program. 
Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when I got to Wichita, so what I didn't know was that this company had been sued by the federal government for its lack of minority participation in the leadership roles. Okay. So I walked into an environment that was um, highly racially charged and I had no idea because I was from outside the community. And in retrospect, they probably picked me for the senior management training program because I was an outsider and they would hope I would be there for a couple of years and leave, right? This is how deep some of that you know, resistance to change on the racial front is in America. Um, so the one thing I had to get re- used to, look, we got racism everywhere. Was, right? Don't, to, to say there's no racism in New York is, is a crop. But the sort of calculated, really, how can we keep folks down? I was just never, just, this was just, I mean, at least you had white people in New York that I like liked Public Enemy, right? They like they might not like black people. They, just, they, they like some rap music. They like some, you know, whatever. But these folks are just a total. And I'm not. I'm generalizing. Some people I was exposed to in key positions were that way. And I was like, I'm 23 years old. I'm yeah. managing a department of 33 people. Um, I had people tell me literally like, yeah, you know, when I was younger, you know, we're young, we're stupid, we're bored. You know, yeah, we used to go to clan meetings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, so there was that social, like, how do I navigate that world of people who, you know, even if they weren't racist, they sort of grew up in, they were breathing that air, they were drinking mm. that water. And even though they might like me and whatever, they, you know, they still lived in, like that contaminates everything, right? Like, mm-hmm. It's like washing your hands, but you're in the middle of a dust storm. Like it doesn't yeah. really matter. <laughs> yeah, no, because this is the way, like the way I see it. They put you like in a quite a tough position because like you're gonna either have someone like going, ah, oh, he's a diversity hire, and he mm-hmm. doesn't know his job, or it's a case of yeah, it, it like yeah, you're just making up the numbers. We're yeah. not gonna take you seriously. Regardless, yeah. so it's a very. And I'm fresh out of, yeah. yeah. It's a very. I mean, I'm fresh out of college, right? So not knowing the job mm. is part of my existence. Oh. <laughs> like, I gotta come in. Like, I gotta come in and learn because you know nobody's gonna teach you how to do the yeah. specific job you're hired for, right? So you gotta you gotta apprentice. Mm. You gotta build relationships with your more senior. People. Like, look, I'm working in a factory that's making aircraft and aircraft parts. Right? I gotta learn this from the senior folks how to think about governing a yeah. department. And then from the junior people who are like literally bucking rivets, right? Like stapling things together. Like I gotta learn all of this. And then at some point I gotta have mastery enough where I can command the respect. Mm. Um, and that was quite a dance. Uh, it was lucky that I am, you know, was very interested in, so I had a passion I learned, I worked hard. Um, and I did find some people that I, that really, that, that, that took me in, you know, and I still send the messages to this day. Yeah. I, you know, I remember going to a country bar and just getting drunk and like literally falling <laughs> off a chair and I'm carrying me out. Um, but finding ways to bridge those cultural gaps, right? Because mm. at the end of the day, we're all human. And as, as much as somebody might say, we don't like this or we don't like that one, once people see your humanity, in a vulnerable, in, and you show it in sort of like in a vulnerable way. It, 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 people have no choice to sort of look past that and see you and connect with you. There yeah. will be people that see you, and then you will make a friend across a cultural boundary. And, and I think, you know, my life is richer for that experience. And mm-hmm. I can tell, you know, though that work that I did at that time has absolutely nothing to do with the work that I do today, the cultural connections the insights into people yeah serve me incredibly well um it helps guide how i do market research right because i realize there's a bunch of people in the middle of the country that you need to understand they're not just like these other people that like this a unique culture and i can speak to that authentically um so you know rich experience i still go back to that community you know every few years to say hello to folks that that took me in both black and white like across the boundaries yeah um and uh, yeah no and and i think people just better serve you know i can imagine there's people in the city 
who don't understand people in Everton, right? Like, yeah, how, yeah. How, how those people? How could those people vote for X? Right? Not to get into <laughs> the politics, right? But until you, you, you experience it, lived experience, yeah, you can't bring the insights into why they see the world that they do, mm. and then find ways to bridge the gap. And I, I think that's something that I pride myself on being able to do. Yeah, I would imagine that like picking up that those skills to bridge gaps must have helped mm -hmm. you like even though you're working in a completely different sector it must have helped mm -hmm. you to no end when coming into a new team like back in like back in new york or wherever it took you uh yeah. in the future yeah yeah so i you know coming out of graduate school mm -hmm. right so from at harvard um again i feel like like I always carry this chip on my shoulder. Maybe one day I'll let go of it, like when I'm driving a Rolls Royce, right? But I always feel like you know, I'm just, I'm just a black kid from the projects who's smart, clever, who crafty, who's made it, and I'm next to these other more polished people. Well, but come uh, on, now come on now. Look, this is the reason why the NBA exists. Look, if mm -hmm. you got this, if you got the gumption, the intelligence, and then right. basically you've like worked your ass off out in the industry. The NBA is meant to be that next thing to help you get that next yeah. run up the ladder. And yeah. Uh, yeah. For, for you to get into Harvard, Harvard's business school, come on now. That is yeah. down in but, but you know, but then, then you're there with 800 other folks yeah. who got in, who are incredibly ambitious, mm -hmm. and incredibly hardworking, right? Yeah. So, you know, in, 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 you know, in many ways, some of them might have been hardworking, more hardworking than me because they understood how challenging the game is. I've always been in my group, one of the smartest. So I get to Harvard and I'm like, oh man, I gotta ratchet up this game, right? You know, I'm working till 11, you know, one o'clock every morning, preparing classwork. Um, yeah, it's a real, real pressure cooker. And you know, your first year is sort of sorting out business, right? You know, which crew you're gonna be. It's not, yeah. You're know, putting on a sorting hat, right? And figure out where you're gonna be, where you fit in. You know, are you an alpha? Uh, are you, you know, are you going to be prized and valued by the most prestigious hiring companies, the Goldman Sachs and the McKinsey's? And it's funny, in retrospect, I think I'd always had this, I got to prove that I'm smart thing. I, this is probably like an insecurity that I've always had. Right. So I, I went for the, the toughest job to get. Um, and a company that did very little hiring of black people back then, which is a company called McKinsey and Company, management consultancy. Yeah. Um, and um, I remember all the folks who were going to the company, uh, company uh, career fairs that they would hold and the presentations. And I was always in the back, probably a little rough around the edges and the more polished folks were up front schmoozing. I didn't have the schmooze game down. Um, but you know, what was interesting, what was neat about those folks, it's like, like all that was nice, but if you weren't, if you couldn't deliver the smarts, yeah, like, you, know, you know, you didn't get the job. And um, out of all the MBA hires, they, out of all the interviewing McKinsey did in the summer of, for the summer of 92, um, they only hired three African-Americans, three wow. black folks across the country, like two from Harvard, one from Stanford, and none from anywhere else. They come. Um, and I was, I was one of those guys, right? But yeah. it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you're the, the beagle, you're the beagle chasing the car, and I caught the car. And I'm like, now, now what do I do with the car? <laughs> I like, mm, I've got this now, where do I go yeah. with it? Mm. Yeah, yeah, wow, man. I never yeah. saw this day of like getting the car, and I, I caught the car. Yeah. Uh, great summer, there may be an offer um, to come back which is great, right? Because it's a little extra bonus when you work for them in the summer, you come back and throw some extra change, which is great to help me pay for school. Um, <laughs> and, and, and learn quite a bit there. Um, had a decent run there. Um, and then from there, I moved, you know, this is, oh, by the way, this is in the Cleveland office, so it's not in my home city. Um, got a little bit homesick, figured I didn't want to be a consultant for the rest of my life, and went, moved back to American, uh, to New York City to work for American express uh -huh. that's a whole big that's a whole big chapter of like my, my career yeah no because like this is the thing like with regards to sort of like there's a certain mindset at mckenzie 
And because mm-hmm. like the reason why I say this, like my lady, she did the MBA at Judd, mm-hmm. at Judd Business School in Cambridge. Yeah. And like, basically she was talking about the whole, like a number of different people talking about the whole interview process. And like, it was uh, like, it was, you could be working in say, um, oh, fucking hell. Like, let me think of a place. You could be working at, EY, Ernest Young, or like Price Waterhouse Cooper, they had a certain mindset, yeah. but Mackenzie was like, we're Mackenzie. It's kind of like Big Blue IBM back yeah. in the day. And it was just yeah. like, yeah, if you didn't have an inkling of that mindset, they would not even give you the time of day. Of like, thank you very much. Yeah, Bye-bye. no, it's, it's, yeah, it's like, you know, a scientific thinking brought into business, incredible rigor. Mm. And problem solving, incredible intellectual curiosity. But it's probably there that I probably say, okay, I've, I've, I've now, I'm now working in a group of people where I am not the smartest. Clearly, <laughs> like they're like, there was just you walk in, you're like, wow. And you know, I got to see some amazing things. I remember being at a conference for the energy practice, and the guys from Enron were presenting, oh, and they Enron. started talking about, and they started talking about their strategy and what what, what they were promoting and where they were taking the company. I just remember sitting in the back of the room and like, okay, I'm not as clever as any of these other folks, but uh, yeah, this does seem right. <laughs> but maybe they know something that I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can talk to you ad nauseum about off-balance sheet transactions to pump up the, 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 the appearance of doing uh, great revenues. But uh, well, yeah. Uh, if anyone's going to show you that, it's definitely going to be Enron. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but, but it was, look, the time I did at McKinsey was amazing. Mm. Um, it was an amazing training. In a way, I got trained that I didn't get in grad school, in a way I didn't get in undergraduate school, right? And I, I learned a bit more about, again, the work ethic and the influencing and managing meetings and, you know, how to lead. Um, all things that I didn't get necessarily in school and all things that I might, you know, didn't get at the knee of, of an uncle uh, or somebody else because it's just a world that nobody's exposed to. So mm. great, great times. Yeah, because that with, like, the way I sometimes see like higher education, it's about mm-hmm. sort of introdu- like, introducing you to the world and like picking up like sort of skills like leadership and then basically getting that sort of deeper analytical mind comes at yeah. work. What would you say was the, one of the main key things you picked up at Harvard Business School? At Harvard and in the McKinsey, I think it's the importance of the numbers, particularly mm-hmm. at Harvard, right? Harvard is all about, like, hey man, then, you know, every day you're getting a business case at Harvard. Right? Yeah. And so it's not proper like whiteboard teaching you technique. It's let's look at a business situation Mm. Um, and let's analyze the problem. In the back of every case, they give you the financials for a company, and you look at the financials, and you look at what was said in the interviews, and uh-huh. piece these together, and you say, this is what's going on. And so what you learn is this ability to extract data and then tell a story, mm. right? And, and what you find in corporate America, in the world, is your ability to drive change is your ability to, to extract information, to craft it into a story that people could quickly and easily digest mm-hmm. and get on board with to move to action. Important corporate America, important politics, uh, important in driving social change. That's what I've learned. Um, it's the most important, one of the most important things. If you can't do that, um, whether you're working in advertising, you've got to get an insight that taps into somebody's identity that drives them. It's like, yes, I'm going to buy that Porsche. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Or it's like, hey, man, this is why universal healthcare is good for you. Like, that is like the most critical thing. Um, and and um, I, 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 it's funny, I'm teaching my son that now. Right? My son, he's 10, going on 11. And he's into stop motion videos. He's got all these Legos and all these Uh-oh. action figures, and he follows these guys on YouTube who do the stop motion figures, uh, uh, stop motion videos. And what I say to him is like, okay, let's sit down and let's talk about the script. What is the story? What is the mm. arc? Where are we going with this? You have to really think about that and how it's going to hit people. Um, 
how it's not going to be too much. Yeah. How it's not going to be too little. And let's think about that. So again, so by experience, he'll benefit from, uh, again, that's a, that's a big theme of my life. It's like how do we take knowledge and pass it on generation, generationally? Yeah, no, no. I think with regards to sort of generational thinking, I think that's something what needs to be uh, definitely put into play because what I what you kind of see happen, like in well, in many sort of black communities, is there'll be a surge, one, and then it just drops away, and mm -hmm. it's like all those lessons are forgotten. And with regards to sort of, I think that's partly down to there is no such thing as a financial education mm -hmm. in school. It's like, yep. how do you balance a checkbook? What is like, if you use credit cards, what's this? How can lo like loans be used to sort of acquire property or anything like this? I know mm -hmm. it's something like some people are like, oh, okay, but it all kind of ties in to sort of like a bigger picture of, if you know this, you're gonna know that and you can know right. how it's gonna affect this. So there's always a sort of connecting chain all the way through to help. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think there's also, if we, we step up from that, the question again becomes why? Like, mm -hmm. how do we not pass out things generation? And one of the things I try to do is observe folks who succeed um, or groups that succeed. And one of the things I've noticed is that, and, you know, people may blast me for this, you know, as black people, we're taught that you have to work twice as hard as to get, half as, much. To get, to, to get half as much, right? Mm. The reality is working twice, it, it's almost impossible to work twice as hard as the next person to, be, to get half as much. It's almost hard, it's almost impossible to be twice as smart as the next person, right? Because yeah. every group's got tons of folks. What I found is we work hard as individuals. Like I'll keep, if I'm struggling with calculus, I'll double down and triple down on the hours working by myself yes. to, 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 to improve my mastery. And what's been shown is other groups, particularly if I go to like the Chinese and other Asians, like Koreans and such, and Japanese, what they do is they study in groups. They're not afraid to show and to share learnings across mm. each other. And they'll collaborate and they'll pool the knowledge and they'll advance the whole group. And I think there's probably an opportunity for us to do a little bit more of that. In mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, because I was talking to um, a lady named Rebecca. Why can't I remember her last name? Uh, Rebecca, yesterday for the podcast. Uh, she, uh, Rebecca Robinson. Uh, she mm. does uh, financial advice for women. And like one of the things as like, a late, like as a mother herself of two children, she like she went from like having her first child and kind of working, 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 and then when her second child came along, then like there was like no income. Now she's like got the mindset of building a team, so there's mm -hmm. can help her do X, Y, and Z, so she can concentrate mm -hmm. on this and have another part of a team to do like tackle that, and. It's always like, you know what I mean, um, virtual assistants types things, but it's still, the, still, the process, I believe, is still the same thing. Knowing how to build a team, maximize your efforts on many fronts rather than sort of being mm -hmm. like killing yourself, trying to like run, like run everything, which... Yeah, and, and controlling things, right? Yeah. Like you have two, two, two paths forward, right? Like take a pie, you can figure out how to eat more of the pie, Right, mm -hmm. and you can stress yourself trying to control the eating of the pie, yeah. or you can figure out how to make the pie bigger to let more people eat. Yeah, I think you know some of our cultural traditions um, lead to sort of the more individual, not individualistic, but sort of like big man control everything and little. You know, you you drop some crumbs down to to the little right. It's a very yeah. tribal, very you know traditional way of thinking. Versus, hey, I'm going to figure out how to deploy my resources, decentralize control, make mm. the pie bigger, and also plan for succession, yeah. right? right? Teach the next generation. Um, and I think that's a cultural learning that I've observed from being exposed to all these different cultures and say, okay, now I can bring this back to my community, um, to my people. 
Yeah, like one thing with regards to economics and like uh, communities. Um, like I was watching. Didn't think this conversation was going to go this way in this interview. Huh? <laughs> um, like, I don't like with regards to the conversation. The conversation goes where it goes. Where like, it goes, yeah. yeah. Man. Like I don't. This is the why I don't sort of like go. This is what I like. No, I yeah. just let it go. Uh, now, yeah. as I was saying, with regards to community, I was watching a TED talk uh, about. It was about black spending power, and like they were talking about how long. Uh, I think like I'm paraphrasing slightly. How long does t- like twenty dollars stay in each community? Mm. And like they went, yeah, I believe they went Chinese community, like Asian community. They said it stays in the community for thirty days before that money goes out. Mm. And then it get, went with um, Jewish community stays in that community for twenty days before it goes out. White, like Caucasian, like I think it was around about the same amount of time, and then it goes out. How long do you think it stays in the black community for? Probably about five days. Guess again. Oh man, don't tell me it's in hours. Please don't tell me it's in hours. Uh, two days. No, it stays in the black community for five to six hours and then it's gone. Yes. Like, uh. And like, this is the thing, like, it ties in with like how you're talking about generational. Like, because mm-hmm. I think with regards to like, regards to many a person out there who has been highly educated or has that sort of entrepreneurial spirit i think more people need to be out there making businesses companies and basically um learning the sort of capital side of it like the real big side of it because yeah. don't get me wrong yes I, I would always go start a business start a business start a business but to do something grand huge knowing how to do like vc stuff that's something which evades me i've not i when i went to university i only did psychology and sociology i wasn't into a whole business side of things I haven't got an mba but i think more on that level yeah. rather than you know what i mean where it is. And, and, and what i always tell people right this is all you know there's a lot of self-directed learning you could do it's great that i have this stamp of approval from the Harvard Business School, right? It opened mm. the doors for me, right? But my learning doesn't stop there. And I yeah. said to other folks that you know, your, your learning can be quite self-directed. I think the thing that I, I've taken away along the, this vein, right, is I, you know, I'm well qualified to get a job in somebody else's corporation yeah. and make lots of money. And then, of course, I'm at their whim. They can release me at any time. Mm. Um, hi, Marcus. Um, hold on one second. What's that? Uh, good year one. My son asked me for the wife, wife, wife password. Um, so the, yeah, the thing that I, I've taken away is now I understand the importance of bringing world-class skills mm. to basic services. Because to your point, how do you keep the money in the community? Yeah. You actually have to have a series of services that are well run so that people don't leave the community mm. to get something they could get in the community. When I look, I start thinking about what my retirement looks like. Um, again, I get quite nationalistic, if you will, as it relates to Jamaica. Um, and I start thinking about what does my life look like if I move back to Jamaica, right? Yeah. I could do the typical, you know, guy in America has made a lot of money by a couple of condos, um, and I can go back to Jamaica. But that doesn't really move Jamaica forward. Right, oh. and it doesn't take advantage of my life skills um, that I've acquired in business. And I started mm-hmm. saying, okay, if Jamaica was to advance as a country, where could my skills be of service? Right, in doing something basic. And I've started to explore food production. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we help Jamaican farms become more productive? Um, and in and your, your point about you know understanding the capital side. Of so one of the things you find out when you look at Jamaican food production is the businesses are undercapitalized, mm. right? And then you look at the root cause of why they're undercapitalized. It's because, and this is a problem in West Africa as well, a lot of folks don't have clear title, can't prove clear title. Is so if you mm. can't prove clear title, you can't borrow. If you can't borrow, you can't improve your, 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 your capital 
you know, that you deploy, you know, your, your tractors and this and that, and you also can't get skills yourself. Yeah. So I started looking at how can I bring that knowledge of navigating this system, creating entities that provide capital to upskill and upcapitalize the food production so that Jamaica becomes more self-sufficient. Right? My fantasy is like, how can I turn Jamaica to Wakanda? <laughs> like, how do I, how do I take that that warrior maroon spirit of independence to make them self-sufficient? Because they are very, I mean, we're a proud people, we're an innovator and a resourceful people. But the way the world capital system is thrust things upon us, mm. um, there's some barriers we need to overcome, and so. I, I think it would be remiss for me to not look back and see how I can use all this experience I gained here in America to, you know, do something um, to help um, our country's mm. events. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. I agree. And like this is the thing, like because I think like someone like yourself is definitely going to be sort of well placed in like helping with something like that. The reason why I say mm -hmm. that is like when you were like your time at American Express, like it was kind of, how can I say? It definitely, like for me, when I look back sort of at the mid nineties to the early 2000s, mm -hmm. like it was definitely a shift in the way everything was done. It was the start of it. And it like that sort of like trying to find the new sort of ways of doing things, what work, what don't work, everything. Mm -hmm the rise of the internet because like this is the thing you tell your son like there was a time there was no internet you could like you basically to search for information you either had to have encyclopedias in your house go to the library or you had to wait for a documentary <laughs> which yeah, would be televised whenever it's televised right good luck nah, man, i could tell you yeah i could tell you stories so I was, during my time in American Express, um, I was there. So I was working, just to set the context, I was working in the corporate strategy team. Yeah. The corporate strategy team, it's like an internal McKinsey team of you know, folks from consulting firms who were come in and work on big, big initiatives for the mm. CEO to help transform the company. At the time, the CEO was Harvey Golub, very successful in, in launching and revitalizing American Express. But we're in that time where Ken Chenault, um, one of the first black CEOs of a major fortune, I mean, was, I mean, I think America is supposed to be a Fortune 100 company at that time, mm. um, was making the transition. It's, it's a big thing. Um, and so I was at the table in the middle of these conversations, um, one on the future of the American Express business, how we're going to transform it, what businesses we're going to sell off, where we're going to double down investments in it, two, yeah. observing this power shift, um, this, this, this handing off of the, the ship from Harvey to Ken Chenault and what Ken had to deal with, you know, as an African-American man, with all the publicity in the midst of a major lawsuit against Visa and MasterCard, mm -hmm. and then the internal politics, um, you know, what it took for him to, 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 to handle, to navigate that, and then have an incredibly successful run as CEO. It's really amazing to be in the middle of that. And I, I learned a lot. Um, what I learned is, is, excuse me, fuck all difficult. <laughs> to do, like, this man, like I would watch him leave his office on a Friday. Like, he has a, you know, an office in downtown right across from the World Trade Center at the time. Yeah. And then he had his weekend house out in the Hamptons, and they have a helicopter that would just fly him out there. Um, and he would leave like with a duffel bag full of decks <laughs> that he would be reading over the weekend just to keep up with the business, like, like a duffel bag, right? So you feel bad, like, yo, oh, man, oh my God, I gotta work. I gotta put in eight hours on a Saturday yeah. to, on this initiative. I'm like, yo. Oh, okay. and, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I mentioned this story because it goes back to something I was saying earlier around what does it take for you to succeed, right? To, mm -hmm. to, to have that trajectory. And one of the things that I learned I, in observing Ken, I sort of distilled this down to three things, right? One, you have to have the raw capability to perform. Mm -hmm. Two, 
you actually have the op- you have to have the opportunities in front of you that are meaningful and important to deploy deploy those skills again, so people can actually see. Yeah. Three, you have to have somebody who's willing to see that you've got these skills and advocate for you. And then four, you have to have somebody who's willing to pull you up. And then the fifth thing is, you actually have to have almost not, like not an unfettered path, but you have to have a sequence of these opportunities that lead you up. Because you can have all those things, and if you don't, have, if you, you know, and you move up the organization, if you end up in a dead end business or mm. you know, you know something that's intractable, all of a sudden your rise through the top fails. And then the sixth thing is, you got to be younger than the guy. That, <laughs> that, the, that the guys in front of you, right? Like I watched, yes, it is incredibly difficult for black men. Like it's like, you know, you know, having the camel walk through the eye of the needle, like difficult mm. for a black man to, to make this run. There was also a lot of qualified white guys who didn't make the CEO. Yeah. And they, they looked and they said, you know what? Ken's the, in front of us. Ken is younger than us. Mm. And so I got to think about where else can I go? Because there's, there's a finite number of seats at the top and I'm not going to get this one. So I got to go somewhere else. Yeah, I would add one more to that. The ability to recover if you do stumble. Because yeah. like this is the thing. Um, like success um, is sometimes seldomly linear. But if you mm-hmm. like, when, as you say, you've got to have all of these things going for you. But like, there's going to be times where everyone stumbles and like, you know what I mean, finds that hard road. And like the times people I think really fail and can't recover is like when they lose that ability to like, oh, I stumbled, I've fallen, let me get up. As the old saying goes, fall down seven, get up eight, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And what's interesting, I'm so glad you brought up that point because it's a, it's a critical point, right? You need to have that resilience. Mm. But what you also, what's also helpful is if you could have somebody help you get up, right? Mm. And so, you know, in, in, in our Black and Brilliant subgroup, one of the things we talk about, again, is this, this advocacy piece, right? And navigating the internal policies. Because a lot of times, your falling down is also a function of somebody kicking you down a little bit, right? You run into some, yeah. you've lost some internal battle, you, somebody's pushed you out of the way or whatever, or you or you might have actually had a hiccup. I had something happen to me. I'll be very public with this. Link. I've actually never said this out loud to anybody. Um, but now that we're, I'm in this therapy session here with you. Well, it's uh, just me and you here. Just me and you. <laughs> yeah, me, you and the listeners. But I remember I, I, I had wrote an email about an interaction with a colleague. And I said, you know, he was being very irres- not responsive. And, you know, just, you know, he's just, and I, I mentioned something like this, and I meant yeah. it to go to one person, and it went to more than one person. Ooh. And then <laughs> it got back to this individual. Now, this individual wound up getting pushed out because his performance was, you know, I was spot on, like his yeah. performance wasn't working. But somebody else saw that, and this woman cracked on me every time that she could, and it wound up being a career limited, limited for me. Mm. And no matter how well I performed, um, there weren't other black people that would say, you know what? Yeah, he had this hiccup, but let me expend some political capital to Mm. uplift him. What we've found in our black and brilliant group in our conversations is it's very easy for black people to advocate to say, oh, yeah, you need to interview this person for a job. Right. Because it really does. You don't really have to expend a whole lot of political capital. It's yeah. harder, to, it gets harder to say, I might hire this person or I strongly want you to hire them because they themselves are in a political, in a sort of precarious organizational mm-hmm. position. And then it becomes really difficult. Like this person has hit a bump in the road. Let me go and help them, help pull them up. That's a really tough thing um, that we because sometimes we feel, uh, you know, our, our positions in company is somewhat tenuous, um, that we, we, we don't do as much. And we're trying to f- give people advice and counsel, make them aware of this so that more of that happens. Mm. Yeah, no, like, this the thing. I, look, I, I say it, like, not, like, sort of, like, being in this sort of major corporate world game. Like, I do what mm. I do. I get right. on with my life. But, like, to, like, to go, yeah, like, it, it would be very easy 
for someone who doesn't have skin in that type of game to like go, ah, oh, yeah, you should really just be there for each other and like put like, you know what I mean? Put your neck out mm. for that person. Mm. Look, uh, I, I, I have to like go, there are some people you look at, you know, you know they're your friends and stuff like this and you like go, you are not what I call the brightest star in heaven. And mm. like, me putting you, like me putting you out there is going to only hurt us both out. But like if there is an exceptional talent, yeah, I'd say always look out for that because when they shine, you'll shine, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I understand how you got to be careful with that. And I understand why some people wouldn't yeah. like go, yes, let me do that. And I think sometimes yeah. there is an emphasis uh, amongst the black community. Like, why, why can't you get them a job here? <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Don't know yeah. what they're Yeah. No, it's interesting, right? You know, Tony, um, I came to meet Tony Ethic from the Black Ability where you saw that post. Yeah. He came to meet him years ago, right? Interviewed me for, recommended me for a job or we were looking to work together. I wound up going somewhere else. Mm. But he is someone that has um, very actively used his position and his capital to advocate for, 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 for Black folks. Mm -hmm. um, to hire, um, to, to, to sort of lift people. And it's been, you know, not everyone has made it, but it's really... You know, it's heartening to see that. And we started talking about why does that not happen more? Um, mm. And it all happened. You know, it's your ability to do that is a function of how strong a performer you are. Right? It goes back to, you know, doing twice as well to get, you know, hopefully yeah. not three quarters as much, right? <laughs> not half as much. Mm. And, and so the question is, how do we find the real, real star performers at the senior levels that can advocate for, you know, up and coming talent who can, you know, give a stamp of approval that's officially recognized. Mm. Uh, I'm just saying, you know what, you know what, if Maurice or if Tony or if this person puts a stamp of approval on that person, then well, by God, I can, um, I can expend some political social capital to help yeah. them move forward. Yeah, but it's dicey. Yeah, no, I know it's dicey. Um, like, like there is a picture of my girlfriend's class when she went to Pembroke University in Cambridge. Like yeah. basically Cambridge and Oxford, you've got a number of different college campuses and then you sign up to that, but you go to like the main sort of like school. Right. Um, and as I look at the picture, um, there is like, yeah, it's mostly a white, black, white group. There is a couple of black people, quite a few Indian people, like Asian people, but it's a case of you kind of look at it and go, right, like this sort of higher echelon, getting more people going through these schools. Um, it, like the way I look at it, going through like schools like Harvard, Yale, Cambridge, Oxford, is helping putting you in to a group and like community of people who are mm -hmm. going to end up being high achievers. And mm -hmm. if we can get more people into these schools, into this sort of realm of influence, I think that would be, it would do a hell of a lot of good rather than not. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's a huge, you're absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. And then the trick is then, how do I, how do we come back with, you know, it's like you said, these discoverers are across the world to go find new lands of, of wealth and opportunity right now. Mm -hmm. You've got to come back with, here's what I've learned in my journeys. Yeah. And you bring back the knowledge to your community, right? You know, yeah. so I look back to where I've come from. And I'm like, Jesus, like, how can I, how can I bring some of that back to, you know, you know the, the projects and those folks or, um, you know, Jamaican community, like whoever, like, how do I bring that back? So yeah. I think it's, it's those two things, right? Because without a foundation, you're always in a perilous position, right? Mm -hmm. like, like, I can make a good living here in America, can have a house, but I guess if things go sideways, right? Like Trump yeah. gets another four years, right? Like, what does that look like? I got, <laughs> things can be taken away. Well, so, well, yeah. well, well, I've got <laughs> well, I don't think that's going to happen. Well, like, uh, I sit here, yeah, yeah. And I look at it and go, uh, because yeah. let, let me just say this, with regards to the Democrat Party, uh, yeah, putting Biden <laughs> forward, yeah, look, um, all I've got to simply say is, it, it, it looks like they're not even trying to win. Look, if when you put like someone forward, like look, when it was Sa Bernie Sanders, 
and Biden, like as the two front runners, it was just like, I looked at Biden and went, are you sure you know what day of the week it is? Not like, you know what I mean? Because like, you, you seem overwhelmed. And Bernie Sanders, like, the more I look at that guy coming through, he's a lot mm-hmm. of talk and no real sort of action, if you get what I mean. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, and this is a, you know, one of the insights I've gotten into humans, and particularly in some of my work more, more recently, is that mm. people are way more tribal than you think they are. Yeah. And, you know, and, 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 and people play identity politics way more than you think they do. You know, they've, you know, in America, we're really great about saying, you know, saying to black people, oh, you need to stop playing identity politics. White people play identity politics probably I have a lot more than black people. And what you find is that um, what makes Trump popular and what makes Biden palatable is that he plays to an identity that makes people comfortable. What makes, what, what people reject about a Bernie Sanders is at the end of the day, they don't really give as much give as much care about policy as you might think, right? Mm-hmm. The, you know, the other group might put into place Sanders policies, right? The, the right, and all of a sudden they're acceptable. But if the left puts those into place, they're bad, which mm-hmm. tells you a whole lot about the tribal, emotional, cultural affinities versus folks actually understanding policies. Uh, I think, mm-hmm. I, like, I think, like over in the states over in the uk and everything like that it's like it's not even it's not even the policy what matters anymore it's mm-hmm. more the emotion how it makes you feel purely and simply Absolutely. if you've got the woman if it, if that person gives you the woman fuzzies they get they're going to get in mm-hmm. and policy be like damned you like that go right uh you want to do this policy like to like surveil everyone's internet or you want to do this uh no <laughs> but mm-hmm. if you like go yeah but you remember this time of like time of old and this 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 how did that make you feel yeah, oh, yeah. Really no, it's, good. It's, it's, yeah. And it's funny right because a lot of the work that i've done recently and the work that i'll be doing going forward mm. and basically it's marketing and advertising right which is rooted in the social sciences of understanding people yeah. what what feeds their emotional needs for becoming their aspirational self, right? All that Maslow stuff, right? And to your point, it's like, I, I always use this example. Uh, Audi A4, the BMW 3 Series, and a Mercedes C-Class basically all perform the same. But <laughs> yeah. they speak, they basically speak to different tribes, right? If you're BMW guy, you're all about being an alpha male. If you're the Mercedes guy, you're sort of like, I'm doing what mainstream people expect me to do as I succeed. And if you're yeah. the Audi guy, you're like, I'm cool standing apart from the world. I don't necessarily want to stand out and be flashy, but I'm very comfortable in my own skin standing up. And so when you recognize that people have these different needs and you can feed them the same thing, mm. uh, you realize how much, how you can speak to people via emotion and be like tribal affinities to get them to buy your product, whether it's a car yeah. or political direction or, you know, supporting a social cause or whatever. Mm, no, no. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, with regards mm-hmm. to the sort of marketing world, um, mm-hmm. like with the whole changing thing, but there are many a person who, like, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Like there's his like sort of like mantra to sort of marketing and everything like that. Like do TikTok, do like this, like yeah. Put like go with undervalued attention and go forward with that. Now that is one way, but in this sort of modern corporate setting, what is that like now? Because is it leaning towards what he says or is it sort of a little bit more complicated now? I say it's a little bit more complicated. Look, you know, once upon a time mm-hmm. before we had what I call the democratization of communication, right? You know, 30 years ago, brands would blast TV ads at you. Yeah. And they didn't necessarily have to listen to you, right? Because there weren't many channels for them to listen to you through. Mm-hmm. Now you've got all these two-way social media platforms 
Um, you've got these devices that are providing feedback. Um, and humans now have a much greater ability to provide reviews and just tell the story of like, like you know, let me tell you why you shouldn't fly United, right? Mm. Like, you know, if United lost your bag 30 years ago and they treated you like crap, you had no ability to blast them. Yeah. Today, you, you, you know, you break somebody, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen this video, uh, United Breaks Guitars, where this guy was going, he's a, he's a, a musician, he's traveling, he sees through the window, the baggage handler is basically throwing his guitar around, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. After, after, after they told him he couldn't carry the guitar on yeah. the plane, he checks the guitar and they just damage it. They just, he's very rare guitar. So, right, so, and then they give him the standard like $1,000, blah, blah, blah. It's a rare guitar. He can't play the gig, all the stuff. And they just handle him, like pushing him away. Yeah. He creates, a musician, he creates this YouTube video it goes viral, it's 25 billion views. And, and he basically, through this effort, and then now, so once it starts going viral, they start yeah. trying to offer him more and more and more. And what shows you is the balance of power mm. between the consumer and the brands has shifted. Um, he took, you know, his, this one incident probably took about 10% off of the value of United for like a year and a half. And I don't think United's ever recovered because it's become, it's come to light that operationally they don't treat people well. So this yeah. is what I mean that is this democratization mm. um, and the balance of power um, being shifted a little bit more towards the consumer. So all that to come back to how do I see marketing? I see marketing as now brands need to take cues and they need to listen to the consumers a lot more mm -hmm. and figure out what do consumers like and how to become more of that, right? You actually have to think of the, the brand as a person or as a leader of a group. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, if I'm the leader of this tribe, where are the people that overlap with me um, that will have affinity to who I am? Mm -hmm. And how do I become more of that? How do I talk to them? How do I pull them in? How do I send out cues that you, we are one? And it used yeah. to be, you need to be with me. Now it's, let me tell you why we should be together. And I've listened to you and I've become more of that. Um, whether it's Ford saying, I want to be more tough. And mm -hmm. I know that tough is important to you. We embody tough. Let's be tough together. We're only selling trucks. We're getting rid of cars in the U.S. And this is what we stand for versus like a company that's like more generic. Like, so I think brands are being forced to be more pure or more committed to something that resonates with the core customer. Mm. Um, like so, I, I, I that's my identity. So maybe Gary, Gary probably talks a little bit about that, but he probably talks a little bit more about the tactics. I think there's a broader philosophical change, mm. um, recognizing that, that what draws people is the, the emotional and the cultural identity, to your point earlier. Mm. Yes, yes. I think, yeah, definitely. Uh, over the next, I'm going to say, 12 to 18 months, when we come out of the like the lockdown world, I think mm -hmm. this is going to be definitely something which is going to be more in play uh, going oh, forward. Hugely in play, right? So I work with some thought leaders who are authoring pieces of what brands should do in this moment of COVID-19, mm. in this moment of seeking greater justice social justice equity and they're like what do we do right what what's the advice that we give companies right which is you know one it's tough to, to be a company being tasked with like i gotta solve america's social justice problems like yeah <laughs> i should have that burden right but but number two is you know you have to figure out who you are at your core mm. and where do you have a right to have a conversation, right? So you're Ford, you probably don't have a whole lot of right to, to, to have conversations around police reform, but you, there might be things that you can do historically because of what your founder, what were important to your founders around education, Yeah. right? And then you can talk about in that domain of getting equity, a brand can speak, can do. And I think brands are gonna start figuring out, okay, where are the domains where I have the right, where I'm relevant mm. to have those conversations to drive change, to drive impact. So I, I see that. 
and 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 that would you know that's what i would counsel people to do that's what i would help them do mm -hmm. so with regards to yourself uh what do you find like what do you think your future is going to be like in the next say three to five years time yeah I, that's interesting right now you know i'm I know I look young, you can't see me in the podcast, right? But, uh, you know, right now, you know, as, as Dr. Strange said, man, we're in the end game, <laughs> right? So it's the race to, you know, to, to prepare for the retirement. But I think, no, I think in the next three to five years, um, so I'm in the midst of a career change. Uh, mm -hmm. My company, Can't Talk Consulting, was bought by Bain Capital. And as some of you may be aware of like when private equity comes and buys your company, there's, there's always a big turn. To me yeah. So I'm like literally two days away from making a decision on starting, taking on a new role, um, either with a big tech company or with a big advertising agency. I'm, wa I'm wavering between these two. Um, what will my future look like? That's a very tricky question. Because socially, yeah, it's socially, um, I'm probably going to probably do a lot more writing Okay. Uh, to talk about some of these, uh, you know, the, the things that, some of the things that we talked about, how to move brands and how to move individuals forward. Mm. Um, if I end up at the advertising agency, it's a very different trajectory because I'll be helping, I'll actually be helping one particularly, like one of the five largest brands in the U.S. Um, articulate who it is and what it wants to be and how it's positioned for mm. the future in this world of 5G and all this stuff. So it's a telecom company. Uh, don't so say 5G. Very different. <laughs> don't say yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Hey, hey, you know, public uh, service announcement. The public service announcement, 5G does not cause COVID. Uh, <laughs> so it's just, just, just dead that right now. Um, <laughs> for the devil, but as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all that, right? Yeah. People got COVID in, in, in Ecuador right now really bad, and it has nothing to do with 5G. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so with that being said, so, you know, I might be working with a brand to help, you know, them articulate and think about mm. being better, smarter, connecting with their consumers and uh, just doing more of that work whilst on the side mentoring um, and thinking about how technology can move my community forward. If I end up in one of these tech platform companies, that's a great question. Um, you know, I might be doing more work on the inside to help get more folks like me on the inside, you know, once I submit myself. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's hard to say, right? Um, but there's definitely, you know, how do you balance the internal and external? I always tell people, and I advise this to folks, particularly folks getting out of, you know, university about to really start their career, their main career in earnest. Look, you have three, you have, everybody has a recommended daily allowance of satisfaction you need in your life, mm -hmm. right? And you can get it from one of three places and you need to balance it out. You, know, you need to sort out how you're gonna balance it out, right? You get it from your social community, right? You know, the hobbies, the passions, your crew, right? You get it from your family and you can get it from your professional career, right? Mm -hmm. So there are lots of people who get, you know, a disproportionate from their professional career. Yeah. There's a lot of people get disproportionate from the family. And some you get this portion of the social I think for me, as I think about what's next to me, is just making sure I continue to expand my consumption of satisfaction that I do it in a very balanced way, in a very purposeful way. Um, I think early in my career, probably not enough on family. Mm. Um, probably, <laughs> interestingly enough, probably too much on social, uh, probably too much on, on, on work. Um, they'll probably still, you know, I've come to grips with, I'm very excited that I can get more from work by where I choose yeah. to. You have more power. And quite frankly, if you choose a career where you're not getting that satisfaction, you won't thrive. So it's really important to make sure you get, that you enjoy the work. Because work is hard enough as it is. Mm. So, you know, I've really learned that late in life. Like, look, man, do work that's interesting to you. Work with people that are good to you, um, that are good to be around because to really shine, to really develop expertise, you need that support environment. And then, the, you know, the family piece is huge, right? It's, it's why we're here. Um, so I want to make sure that that balance stays true. Outstanding, outstanding. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So uh, I've got to say, yeah, I do like, I do like what you're saying. Like, yeah, there's some really important points there. Uh, 
if you can, uh, in the future, with, you, with regards to your writing or some other medium to get some of that marketing information out there to sort of like up and coming businesses in like mm -hmm. black community or in like to youngsters who are looking to help like start something new. I think that'd be really powerful uh, going yeah. forward. I think really sort of grat most really quite gratifying. But yeah, mm -hmm. God to say. Yeah, yeah my, I, want, I want to encourage people. Well, look, we got a lot of people going chasing jobs in big corporations. You know, I'm not saying don't do that. What I'm saying is do it purposefully mm. uh, because there's a bunch of, there's a, uh, a quite, and I think people underestimate the skills that you can get in that environment that you could bring back to smaller businesses in your community that you can use to build capital, mm. right? Because as long as you're working for somebody else, I mean, unless you're a star, like I have a friend I went to high school with. He's a CEO of a major division of a major telecom company. Yeah. And he's done a fantastic job of, in the corporate world, accumulating wealth. Um, but that's a rare person. Um, you know, most people have a, you know, a solid career. You get a few stock options. And then mm -hmm. in your 40s, you're like, okay, where, you know, how am I going to accumulate wealth? And, and, and there may be an opportunity for some of those folks to get off that path, take the bit of capital that they have, yeah. and to start something that is germane, um, relevant, important to the community, whether it's a, a you know, educational tutoring service, mm -hmm. whether it's, um, you, know, uh, you know, a repair shop, like something. But I think we, we need to give thought to opportunistically doing a little bit more um, of that. And I think, you know, at least in America, there's always been challenges like we don't, the sad reality is a lot of times you have skills that lead you to think that that opportunity is beneath you because we're playing catch up. Like if we had more capital, we would do bigger things. But the, mm. the fact of the matter is we need to play catch up. And some of that playing catch up is having really smart people doing jobs that are probably or starting businesses that on the surface, they're overqualified. To do. But you got to fill that niche and you got to build it so that generation, the next generation will then have capital. You, the problem with us from the African diaspora is we're undercapitalized wherever we are. And so the game has got to be accumulating capital um, so that we can control our destiny a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. With the, the, no, the, no, the no. deep thing. But. Yeah, you know what? On that point, I'm going to end it there. But yeah. <laughs> But uh, can you tell people how they can find you? By uh, how can you find me? Well, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, uh, that's probably the easiest, more efficient way to, to, to find me. Um, and it'll probably be a slap in the face, a wake up call for me. I need to publish four things on LinkedIn so you can see a bit more of my writings and stuff. Um, so this has been a, this has been great for me as well. So I don't want you to think this has been a one way street been quite cathartic so thank you for inviting me on i really appreciate that um i look forward to staying in touch with you as well oh absolutely damn right i've got to say yeah pleasure having you on today sir you've been outstanding i like lots of food to food for thought definitely will have you back on in the future because i feel like i've only scratched the surface of something quite rich and special Oh, thank you thank you for that yeah and uh maybe next time I'm in, the, I'm in the uk if you know if not banned americans from coming this year <laughs> we'll link oh you know what well, i think they're just gonna lock the door well, we'll quarantine you for 14 days let you back out yeah uh, but yeah. yeah absolutely i will take you out it's for interesting too for sure yeah me too right for sure it's interesting how you can create virtual walls right trump has created a virtual wall around this is uh, quite clever <laughs> He's got what he wanted. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. Let me just All say, right. Maurice, thank you very much for coming on today. I would like to say thank you to all my friends and life warriors out there. Have a great day. Have a fantastic weekend. Well, whenever this comes out. And all I've got to say is be cool, be excellent, be fantastic. Be all the positive bees you can be in this world. I hope that's good for you. <laughs> Peace. Yeah. Peace, brother. All uh, right. Uh, blessings. <laughs>